And now it's my pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Michelle Albert. Dr. Albert is a cardiologist, researcher, and leader who has excelled across many areas of science and patient care. Her home institution is the University of California at San Francisco. She serves UCSF as the Walter A. Haas Lucy Stern Endowed Chair in Cardiology and Professor of Medicine, as Admissions Dean for the Medical School, and as Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Adversity and Cardiovascular Disease, better known as the Nurture Center. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, widely considered one of the highest honors in medicine. Dr. Albert's work focuses on the biomarkers of cardiovascular disease risk and social determinants of health, especially among women and persons of underrepresented groups. In 2018, we honored Dr. Albert on this very session stage with our prestigious Merit Award, and again in 2020 with our Distinguished Population Science Award. Beyond her scientific expertise, Michelle is a friend to me and to so many of you here today. It is now my honor to introduce the Lewis A. Connor Lecture presented by the President of the American Heart Association, Dr. Michelle Albert. I'm Barbara Topps. I'm 81 years old, and I struggle with heart failure and lung disease. I'm Akane Tanaban. I'm 50 years old, and I suffer from chronic fatigue and low blood pressure. Regardless of where you're from, regardless of your specialty or area of science, there's one thing each of us has in common experience with adversity. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome back to UCSF's Cardiology Grand Rounds. Today we'll be hearing from our first year fellows who recently attended the annual American Heart Association Conference about the major clinical trials that were presented there. So we're gonna have three trials presented over the course of the next hour. Each trial will take about 10 minutes, and then we're gonna have some time in between each presentation for Q&A. Our first presentation will be from Dr. Evelyn Song and Dr. Ishan Kamat on the Strong HF trial. Dr. Evelyn Song grew up in China in Madison, Wisconsin. She completed residency at Johns Hopkins before coming here to UCSF for fellowship. She is interested in advanced heart failure and cardio-oncology. Dr. Ishan Kamath grew up in South Texas and did his residency at Baylor College of Medicine. His interests lie in heart failure and the development of novel cardiovascular devices. The floor is yours, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll go ahead and share screen. All righty. Well, thank you again for that, for that nice intro. Uh, Today, Evelyn and I will be talking about uh, strong HF, the safety and tolerability uh, and efficacy of up titration of GDMT for patients uh, admitted with acute heart failure. Uh, so to get started, the significance of this is, is uh, I think, pretty apparent. Uh, initiation of GDMT during hospitalization has been shown to be beneficial for uh, several classes of medications, beta blockers, ACE, ARB, ARNI, spironolactone. Um, however, uh, we know from several other studies that GDMT is not started or changed during hospitalization and is left up uh, unchanged for up to a year afterwards. Several studies show that maybe in the teens or 20% of patients don't get uh, GDMT changed during the hospitalization. And, so, and about half of patients actually show that, uh, there's the, that uh, GDMT is unchanged for a year afterwards. So uh, I think there's a practicality aspect to it. People may be concerned about side effects in, in, the, in the setting of hospitalization, but nonetheless, the AHA and ACC guidelines recommend that uh, it is a class one indication to, uh, to start GDMT during hospitalization um, once the patient's clinically stable. Uh, however, the level of evidence uh, basically suggests or basically states that uh, these trials are retrospective or they're meta-analyses or or, or post hoc analysis of larger trials. In other words, there's not been a prospective study to date that the guidelines refer to. And, and so that's what the objective of strong HF 
is, is it's designed to assess the safety and efficacy of a rapid up titration of GDMT in conjunction with close follow-up. Uh, so basic inclusion and exclusion criteria, obviously adult patients younger than uh, 85. Uh, the patients had to be admitted with, heart, with uh, acute decompensation of heart failure 72 hours prior to screening. And, and naturally they have to be hemodynamically stable with signs of volume overload. And interestingly, I thought that they had a pretty stringent NT pro BNP requirement. Uh, naturally it had to be elevated uh, above 2,500. Um, and there had to be a 10% decrease of the lab value during the hospitalization, but still above 1,500. Uh, a key exclusion criteria actually, I thought were pretty, um, pretty reasonable. Um, if patients were previously intoler uh, intolerant to high doses of GDMT, they're excluded. Obviously any recent MI uh, cabbage or, or really active reversible cause of cardiomyopathy were excluded as well. Uh, and then naturally, like with any trial, uh, severe liver disease, severe kidney disease, prohibitive other conditions or life-threatening illnesses were also excluded as well. Uh, and so the, the study was powered for a, a 90 day event rate of 20% of, of the primary endpoint, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, and, and that led to 450 patients per arm. Uh, so now uh, the trial design, excuse me, the trial design uh, started with screening and randomization into one of two arms. The, naturally, the, the control arm is usual therapy and adjustments in care. Uh, and then the uh, high intensity arm basically starts uh, at hospitalization. So before patients were discharged, they receive half dose of therapy. And so half, just as, as an example, what's lifted as half dose, it's metoprolol 100 milligrams daily, losartan 75 milligrams daily, and spironolactone 25 milligrams daily. Then the first week follow-up is a safety visit. So no changes in medication at that point, but just assessing blood pressure, potassium, kidney function, heart rates, and then nt pro BMP and congestion. And the last bit is if there's an elevation, then they would remove from the studies naturally. Uh, and then the, the following week, so week two is when you get full dose. So that's when you're upgraded to metropol 200 milligrams daily, losartan 150 milligrams, or spironolactone 50 milligrams daily. And then subsequent follow-up or safety visits, uh, you could up titrate doses at that point too, but mostly safety visits. Um, and then finally ending with 180 day follow-up as part of the primary endpoint. Uh, interesting thing to note is that the because the beneficial was um, the beneficial effect was so apparent uh, partway through the trial that uh, they actually excluded and terminated the trial early, and excluded some patients from the primary endpoint. So naturally they, they're following the 90 day follow-up. Um, uh, for, for primary data. Um, and just to go over the endpoints, the primary endpoint in 180 days was heart failure re readmission or all-cause all mortality. Secondary endpoints include a change in quality of life, uh, examining the 180-day all-cause mortality alone, uh, and the 90-day um, uh, uh, outcomes as well. And then, of course, the safety endpoints were incidents of emergent treatment for adverse events of these medications, or um, the, the vitals or lab, lab data changes that I mentioned earlier. And, and now um, Evelyn will go into more detail on the results. All right, uh, thanks for that, Ishan. So now moving to the uh, results section. So first, the baseline demographics were similar uh, between the two groups and average age around 63, 60% uh, 60 males. And uh, notably, uh, 40, about two thirds of the patients had EF of 40% or lower um, and a third with EF above 40%. And the average EF was around 36% uh, for this study. And um, so first looking at um, the proportion of patients who are prescribed full optimal dose of heart failure therapy at day 90 and day 180. And um, for all three heart failure therapy groups, uh, the high intensity group had much more patient uh, who are on the full tolerated, full optimal dose of heart failure therapy. For this study, they grouped ACE inhibitor, ARBs, and ARNI under one group, and they did not um, really study SGLT2 inhibitor because because that was not approved or readily available at the beginning of the trial. 
And then similarly, if you look at half to full optimal doses, the intensity group patients had uh, much more of the uh, much more patients in the high intensity group uh, received half to full optimal dose of the heart failure therapies at both day 90 and day 180 uh, for all three groups. And um, we know that all the patients did take their heart failure therapies uh, because for the high intensity treatment group, they had sig more significant reduction in their heart rate, blood pressure, and increase in potassium without significant difference in their GFR. And uh, similarly, patients in the high intensity group uh, had more significant change, decrease in their weight, improvement in their peripheral edema, JVP, and MyHA class, and improvement in their NT pro BNP at day 90. So now looking at the primary endpoint, which uh, was 180 day, uh, 180 day readmission for heart failure and all cause death. And this was lower in the high intensity care group compared to the usual care group. And if you look at the event free survival, uh, more patients, patients in the high intensity group had better survival compared to the usual care with a 180-day adjusted risk difference of 8% and uh, risk ratio of 0.66, both significant. And if you uh, look at the subgroup analysis, so regardless of age, EF, race, region, sex, all subgroups favored high-intensity high intensity care. And um, interestingly, patients with EF more than 40% also favored high intensity care, but the P value for interaction between the two groups were not significant. And also patients with higher baseline and TBMP derived more significant benefit from being under the high intensity care group. And looking at the secondary endpoint, so first looking at the quality of life uh, based on patient reported survey, high intensity care did lead to better quality of life at day 90. Uh, but when they looked at only all cause death by day 80, by day 180 between the two groups, there was actually no difference. And if you remember, the primary endpoint was looking at um, all cause death or heart failure readmission by day 180 and the high intensity group um, had lower risk, but there was no difference when you looked at all cause death only. This suggests that the main uh, benefit in, that we saw in primary endpoint was derived from decreased rate of readmission rate. And uh, lastly, when they looked at uh, outcomes at day 90, uh, high intensity care did increase, decrease the rate of all cause death and or heart failure readmission as well, but um, it was not statistically significant by day 90. So looking at the safety profile, uh, patients in the high intensity care group did have more uh, adverse events, mainly uh, classified as elevation in uh, creatinine uh, or drop of blood pressure or hyperkalemia, but there was no significant difference in the serious adverse events or fatal serious adverse events between the two groups. So um, as a reminder, our heart, current heart failure guidelines do recommend uh, close follow-up after admission for heart failure exacerbation. But as Yishan mentioned earlier, the level of evidence is low and it will be interesting to see how the results of this trial change everyone's practice and guideline in the future. Um, and I do want to mention a few limitations and remaining questions that um, uh, you know come from this trial. First, the study was not um, blinded. So in patients in the high intensity group, they were seen four times within six weeks post-discharge. So could the better outcomes be explained by the extra education and caring from the providers? And secondly, all follow-up visits were performed by cardiologists and heart failure specialists, which may not be practical in our healthcare system. So can the results be replicated with APPs or pharmacists? 
And third, majority of the patients were enrolled from Russia and Africa. Uh, only 8% were from East uh, European countries. Um, so can this be translated to our systems in North America? And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, at the time of um, the study enrollment, SGLT2 inhibitors were not readily available, so not prescribed to most patients. And um, in the ACE inhibitor ARB ARNI group, actually only 8% of the patients were on ARNI. Majority of the patients were on the ARB uh, or ACE inhibitor. So how is this going to change the safety profile since we know that SGLT2 inhibitors and ARNIs are more associated with hyperkalemia, renal impairment, and drop of blood pressure. So these are all um, potential limitations and remaining questions we have. But regardless, um, this is still the first study that demonstrated safety uh, of rapid up titration of heart failure therapies, and it did reduce heart failure readmissions or all-cause death and improve patients' quality of life. But I think the bigger question remains the implementation of the protocol into our healthcare system, as it will likely come um, at very high cost and require a lot of investment and people power. So um, that remains uh, a bigger question. So we want to thank our great family and of course, wonderful co-fellows. All right, open to questions, comments. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Song and Dr. Kamat. That was great. So at this point, we can take any questions or comments from the audience about this strong HF trial. So you can either leave your comment or question in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself to speak. I missed the consort diagram about uh, who, who dropped out or who was removed during the, the process of the trial. Uh, so, uh, as far as dropout, it was, it was, uh, entirely due to safety issues. So, uh, patients who, uh, weren't, uh, weren't able to tolerate, uh, higher doses were, were left at the half dose throughout the trial, but then the, uh, patients who had any serious adverse events like side effects, hypotension, readmission for heart failure, or, um, uh, um, or any other laboratory values of the patients that dropped out. So what were, what were the numbers? For, for both groups, uh, which each group had about 500 patients and only about 50 to 60 in each group dropped out due to the reasons Yishan just mentioned. And they were similar in both groups. Yeah, so- Okay, thank you. And then, yeah. and then to Atif's first point, uh, the uh, follow-up in the usual care arm actually did not have any stringent, uh, you know, one week, two week guidelines or recommendations. So uh, really that kind of remains, uh, to Evelyn's point, she brought up uh, that that also is, is uh, something to think about um, in, in terms of separating out the medication effect versus the uh, stringent follow-up. And I think, Atif, I think that is uh, one limitations we don't know if the benefit is from the medication versus just close checking on the patients. But the caveat, the being plain devil's advocate is, you know, regardless, maybe regardless the reason is it a medication change or close follow-up, uh, the, the high intensity care group did eventually still benefit from, um, from this protocol. Yeah, so I, I think as you're thinking about, you know, what you should take away, you know, it, it, is it that we need better systems for follow-up and, and really seeing these folks after one week, two weeks, um, you know, to assess their volume and then also, uh, you know, titrate their medications <clears throat> or, or is it really the medication effect and just getting them to go and what is the role <clears throat> and what should you do before you discharge them? So I, I think it is an important question. I know there are other studies that have shown benefit, I think with warfarin, <clears throat> for example, way back when it, systolic heart failure, seems like the benefit from that looked like it was more due to the follow-up, just being able to check in on patients because they're getting INRs, but wasn't necessarily a clear uh, benefit with respect to heart failure. Yeah, certainly. And yeah, uh, post, uh, you know, uh, implantable monitoring devices too for heart failure, that, that kind of thing has been brought up too. Obviously, you check in more remotely with patients uh, as well. I, you know, I'll say kind of from my perspective, uh, having changed hospital systems coming to for fellowship, 
uh, UCSF, UCSF is definitely more on the aggressive side, you know, in a, in a, in a good way about uh, starting GDMT while uh, while patients are hospitalized and and getting them when you know once they're clinically stable on, on their way to discharge. So, um, yeah, I mean, the other funny question is like, are, are we already doing a lot of that? I think we are, from my perspective. But but obviously, there's always room for for uh, improving uh, the rates of GDMT here. Any other questions, comments, or love to hear from heart failure faculty uh, if we have any here, if how, how this trial would change your practice uh, or any comments on the trial results. Hey, it's Mandar. Um, I guess uh, I'll speak to, um, you know, I, I agree with Ishan. You know, I think this kind of resembles the CardioMEMS and the Champion trial. You know, it's hard to know whether it was the monitoring or whether it was the rapid up titration of medical therapy in the patients that got the CardioMEMS. Um, and so similarly, uh, we know from this data that rapid up titration and aggressive GDMT um, uh, is going to be better for your patient, whether you do it remotely through CardioMEMS or whether you do it um, uh, with an intensive, you know, clinic visit. Um, I think the bottom line is, like, every time we see a heart failure patient, we should think about up titrating their medical therapy as long as they can tolerate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Aris, and again, Dr. Song, Dr. Kamath, for that presentation. Um, I think just for the sake of time, we're going to move on to the next trial. Uh, so we have Dr. Hope Karan and Dr. Rajiv Nadadur, who will be speaking about novel gene editing therapy for the treatment of transthyretin amyloidosis. Uh, so Dr. Hope Karan is from Wilmette, Illinois. She completed her residency and chief residency here at UCSF. She is interested in interventional cardiology and critical care, as well as clinical outcomes that are related to cardiac devices. Dr. Rajiv Nadadur grew up in Los Angeles and completed his residency here at UCSF as well. He is clinically interested in the genetic predisposition to cardiac arrhythmias and heart failure. Excited to hear from you both. You can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. All right, great. Thanks so much, Layla. And I'm going to, I'm working on two computers here. So I'm gonna to try to share screen and talk on a different one. So just stop me if for some reason you can't hear me. Um, so my name is Hope and I'm gonna start us off here and then Rajiv and I are gonna go back and forth. Um, we've decided to talk about the CRISPR-Cas9 trial, which is um, an in vivo gene editing for transthyretin amyloidosis. And this was presented by Dr. Dr. Julian Gilmore out of University College of London at AHA this year. And so in order to talk through this, we're gonna first talk a little bit about some of the background and make sure we're all on the same page about the pathophysiology and therapies for amyloidosis. We're gonna talk about CRISPR-Cas9 based therapies, and then we'll go kind of more into the trial here. Um, so just to start, I'm gonna take us back a step and talk some about the pathophysiology here. So as a reminder for everybody, these transthyretin tetramers are produced in the liver typically. Um, and what happens both in inherited conditions um, that cause mutations to the transthyretin or in wild type disease from the aging process, essentially these tetramers become monomers or oligomers that then become misfolded. Um, and these aggregate as amyloid fibrils then within the myocardium. Um, and this is what leads to diastolic dysfunction, restrictive cardiomyopathy and eventual congestive heart failure. As a reminder, there's a lot of data that we probably underdiagnosed TTR and HEFPEF. This is just a study that essentially showed on autopsy almost 20% of patients without antemortem suspicion of amyloid um, had LV TTR amyloid deposition. And so this is a lot more prevalent than we previously noticed, and there's a lot more interest in this at this time. What we also know, particularly from neuropathy data, is that greater TTR knockdown is associated with improved uh, clinical scores, and particularly neuropathy scores. And there's a lot of emerging evidence that suggests that this is also true in cardiomyopathy. So a greater knockdown of TTR is likely associated with improved outcomes from a cardiovascular standpoint and cardiomyopathy standpoint. And so that kind of brings us to what, what are our current therapies and what do we currently do? Well, 
you know, the therapies we have are directed at different parts of this kind of uh, TTR fibril creation. Uh, Tefamidus, as we all know, is a TTR tetramer stabilizer. So it essentially binds to the thyroxine binding sites and prevents um, the formation of monomers from, um, uh, from the TTR. And we also have mRNA silencers, which essentially uh, prevents, uh, prevents uh, mRNA from creating these TTR. Um, and so what we know from these current therapies is that particularly in tefamidus, you know, we first saw this come out in, I think, 2018. And now with five-year data, uh, patients who are on tefamidus compared to the placebo group have improved outcomes and improved five-year survival. And so what we know now is TTR amyloidosis remains kind of underdiagnosed as a cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy and HFPEF. And that emerging therapeutics show promise in stabilizing and in reversing the progression of TTR amyloid. And so I'm going to hand over to Rajiv to talk more about CRISPR and then kind of how that contextualizes the study we're going to look at. Hey, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just then. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, quick background on CRISPR-Cas9 and then sort of the, the agents they used in this trial. Um, Hope is going to have to manage the slides for me. I'm on my phone in the general fellows room. Um, but as you guys are probably aware, CRISPR-based technology is, uh, is at this point not no longer new. I think, um, as you know, won the Nobel Prize in 2020. And without getting too much into the detail, as much as I'd love to, um, CRISPR-based technology sort of has revolutionized this world of genome editing, which sort of allows us to target um, various endonucleases, like historically Cas9, but now newer ones to specific regions of the genome and perform sort of fancy editing, you know, whether deletion or replacing or correcting um, to the DNA itself and cells. And this has really sort of been like a huge boom in, in genome editing over the last decade or so. Um, uh, I hope next slide. And then I just want to show a quick timeline of sort of like CRISPR-based technology sort of initially studied in prokaryotes as early as the 80s, but really in the early 2010s is when the mammalian application started like breaking through. Um, and allowing us to use this for therapeutics. And sort of over this last 10 years, we've had a pretty uh, robust growth in various novel agents that are being trialed um, sort of across disease and context to genome edit in the setting of disease. Oh, next. So with that, I thought we could dive a little bit into what the agent they used in this trial was, and in broad strokes, talk a little bit about um, what they did. So they, uh, in this trial, um, they developed, they, not this, they're calling it a compound, which is NTLA-2001, but which is basically a, a lipid nanoparticle, which contains all the elements needed for CRISPR-based editing. And they sort of have targeted this uh, to the liver where TTR amyloid is made. And so within this, you have all the agents needed to, to edit liver cells. And they actually uh, screen, and I won't dive into the details, but they screened a large library of various sort of um, guide RNAs in, in targeting this area of the genome and sort of selected out the ones with the lowest off-target effects and the highest efficacy in, in removing the TTR amyloid gene. Next. And so with that, I'll sort of turn it back to Hope to talk about the study design and then I'll, I'll come back for the results. Yeah, great. So essentially what was presented at AHA and what we know is a subset of a larger ongoing phase one clinical trial. And so the eligibility criteria for people enrolled in this larger trial is uh, either hereditary or spontaneous TTR amyloidosis with either pro predominant polyneuropathy or cardiomyopathy. And we essentially are just looking at, <clears throat> and what was presented was the cardiomyopathy arm. Um, and so there's two phases to this. There's kind of, as you can see on the left here, part one and part two. Um, and what we know right now is the results from this part one dose escalation phase. Um, and so essentially what they are looking at in a small subset of patients is evaluating safety and tolerability um, and measuring uh, serum TTR levels. And so they enrolled, essentially they looked at 12 different patients and uh, there were six patients with NYA class one or two and there were six patients with NYHA class three. 
Um, and essentially they split the NYHA class one and two group. So three of the patients got 0.7 milligrams per kilogram and three of the patients got one milligram per kilogram dosing. Um, all of the six patients with NYA class three symptoms got 0.7 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and essentially with that trial design, they then looked at clinical outcomes. And so um, looking here, essentially of, of one of the major outcomes they're looking at were adverse events. Um, and so you can see here, of all patients, there were six patients that had grade one adverse events. And these were thought not to be related to the transfusion itself um, and were clinically quite mild. There was one patient who had an infusion-related reaction um, that was a grade three infusion-related reaction, which again resolved without clinical sequelae. And then the main thing they were looking at here is looking at kind of serum reduction and TPR amyloid production. And you can see here, regardless of NYHA class or regardless of dose that the patient received, all patients received greater, achieved greater than 90% TTR reduction by day 28. Um, and up till six months out for the patients that were followed, they had continued TTR reduction in the serum. And so I'm gonna turn that over to Rajiv to tell us more about what that means. So I think, uh, thanks Hope. I think, um... This result was like very profound when we saw it live that um, they had such almost total like knockout of, knockout of protein expression at serum levels. And we were all kind of edge of our seats wondering what was gonna be presented next. And um, the results of study past this point were sort of left open. I think um, perhaps uh, the patients haven't been followed past this point or perhaps they're waiting for the other arms of the study to collect the data. But I think our main question is what are the outcomes of these patients after they've you know, functionally lost expression of the TTR gene? And I, they did not present any of that. And in looking through it, I haven't seen any of that. So I think that remains the big open question right now is uh, what happens to these patients after we successfully genome edit out their, their transthyretin genes? I think um, in terms of like, you know, broad questions and there's a lot of open questions about you know, the drug itself, other TTR amyloid um, uh, outcomes about, you know, broadly like CRISPR-based technologies in genome editing. But I think the major hanging question is sort of, I'm, I'm sort of excited to see what happens to these, you know, 12 patients or in larger trials and um, what their improvement in symptoms and outcomes might look like. So uh, with that, you know, as always, I wanna thank the, uh, the fellowship for sending us to AHA and the other fellows for covering and you know, all the faculty. And I wanna thank actually Dr. Ara specifically who sort of uh, um, lent me some slides on TTR amyloid to, to help frame this presentation. I'm happy to take questions on it. Great, thanks so much both. So yeah, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to type it in the chat or go ahead and ask it by unmuting yourself. So Dr. Yuan has a question, just asked him, can you remind us what the normal function of transthyretin uh, in the body is? I guess I could take that. Um, so uh, the, so the, uh, transthyretin has an, a normal endogenous function. Um, it's a retinal binding protein and uh, carrier protein and um, a thyroxine um, binding protein, carry protein. So other studies that have looked at TTRG um, protein expression have also looked at serum levels of thyroxine and uh, retinol, vitamin A levels, actually. Um, I think the study is very exciting. You know, I think um, other um, um, small molecule inhibitors and um, gene silencing therapies have seen similar reductions in TTR, um, patisseran, um, as well as uh, the new agent, vetusiran, um, these are um, siRNA um, and antisense oligonucleotides that similarly reduce TTR protein levels. Um, and those are associated with, you know, hard out outcomes in uh, polyneuropathy and cardiomyopathy. So hopefully we'll see some outcome data with this new technology. I think feasibility wise, I mean, there are, um, the newest agent, uh, Vitusaran, is a sub-Q injection uh, that's administered kind of as a depot shot every three months. Um, and so very 
easy for the patient. This is an IV infusion where the patient, I would imagine, would have to come to an infusion center. We don't know how long um, or you know what the increment of infusions will be in this uh, um, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So it's exciting. I think uh, very uh, interested to see what the outcomes are and how this plays out. Did they share share any of the adverse events from the study yet? I, I mean, this is the main slide with the efficacy. I'm just curious if, um, okay, yeah, right there. Uh, what is the T A? Yes. So I think the sort of yeah the um the I think the big take on point is I think the there was one infusion related reaction, um, but otherwise they seemed largely unrelated. Sort of the adverse events were unrelated to the drug itself, like just sort of incidental um you know, things like COVID during the trial, et cetera. All right, any other questions that we have from the audience about this trial? All right, uh, right. Dr. Klein says phase one is about safety. Um, all right, very good. Well, thank you both Dr. Karan and Dr. Nadador for sharing uh, about that trial with us. So lastly, we have Dr. Arturo Gazga and Dr. Nikki Herrick who will be speaking to us about the ECMO CS trial. So Dr. Arturo Gazga grew up in Mexico and Fresno, California. He completed his residency and chief residency here at UCSF and is clinically interested in cardioobstetrics. Dr. Nikki Herrick comes from Manhattan Beach, California. She completed a combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency at the University of California, San Diego prior to fellowship here. She is interested in both cardioobstetrics and adult congenital heart disease. So you can both go ahead and get started uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Arturo. I um, First question, can you hear my audio? Yes, you're good. And can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I will be uh, uh, doing this presentation for both Nikki and I. Nikki is currently on night, so she is uh, getting a well-deserved break before going back into the hospital tonight. Um, we uh, uh, prepare a presentation on ECMO CS. Um, let me make sure that the, the slides are working. Great. So yeah, this is uh, a, a great uh, uh, paper that was presented in the AHA conference, uh, um, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation in the therapy of cardiac shock. And these were results from the ECMO CS uh, randomized trial. Um, the background on this, uh, BA ECMO uh, is used uh, uh, increasingly now in patients with severe shock. There are some perceived advantages of ECMO uh, compared to other mechanical support devices uh, because of the ability to provide some full circulatory support. And also it allows some gas exchange uh, in cases of right, left, and biventricular failure. The ESC and AHA had, uh, had some statements uh, that recommend consideration of short-term MCS in selected uh, patients with cardiac shock, but there has not been any large uh, prospective randomized controlled trials uh, studying BA ECMO and cardiac shock. So the aim of this study um, was to compare immediate implementation of BA ECMO to early conservative therapy, um, which also allowed a downstream use of BA ECMO in case of hemodynamic deterioration in the uh, in the um, um, uh, conservative therapy group. The study design uh, was a multi-center randomized uh, open label intention to treat case control study. Um, the location was performed in the Czech Republic and it was done in four of the medical centers there. And the funding came from uh, the Czech Health Research Council and they highlighted that there was no industry involvement for this trial. The enrollment dates were in September 2014 and January 2020, uh, 2022. In terms of the inclusion criteria, there were two big components. Uh, one of them, rapidly deteriorating cardiac shock, which gives us a class, a sky class or stage D2E. Um, and they were looking for patients that need repeated vasopressor uh, used to maintain maps of 50 uh, or greater. Um, and they also described that impaired left ventricular function was one of the inclusion criteria, um, and that was described as EF less than 34, 35%, or if the patients had severe MR or uh, aortic stenosis, 35 to 55% was acceptable. Uh, 
It was also allowed to have severe cardiac shock. This was sky class uh, or sky stage D. And that was described by hemodynamics, metabolics, uh, uh, and, and some exclusion of hypovolemia. And you can see hemodynamics is our usual cardiac index of less than 2.2 uh, in patients who were both in nor norepi and dobutamine, um, or in patients that we use systolic function uh, of less than 100 with norepinephrine, dobutamine, uh, and in parallel ventricular function, which is the same description that I gave uh, um, just a few seconds ago. The lactate, if it was greater than three, or the SBO2 was less than 50%. And we uh, they wanted to make sure to exclude hypovolemia, and that was done by CVP of greater than seven, or a, a wedge pressure of getting that than 12. The, the exclusion criteria is listed, uh, age less than 18, life expectancy less than one year, high suspicion for PEs or tamponade was also excluded. If the, the significant bradycardia or tachycardia was responsible for hemodynamic instability, uncontrolled bleeding, uh, if the patient came in with cardiac arrest and was a survivor, um, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, inability to have access for cannulation, like in severe uh, peripheral artery disease, um, and moderate to severe aortic regurgitation, dissection, and non-encephalopathy were um, exclusions. And we do want to highlight that there was no uh, upper age limit uh, in terms of patients. It was uh, We excluded um, uh, uh, patients less than 18 years old. Um, and there was nothing above in, in terms of a ceiling limit of age, except for life expectancy uh, of less than a year. So the randomization was done one-to-one. -one. Patients were either sent to an immediate ECMO implantation or early conservative therapy. And those patients who were in the early conservative therapy, meaning no ECMO implantation, um, they could be transitioned to ECMO uh, if worsening hemodynamics occur. And the worsening hemodynamics was defined by a, a lactate rise by three millimoles per liter. The patients that were enrolled, it was 122 that were uh, initially considered, 61 and 61 per, uh, per group respectively. Um, after uh, five of the patients did not sign informed consent, we ended up with 58 patients in the ECMO group and 59 patients in the conservator group. The baseline characteristics, and this is a reduced table uh, from, uh, from everything that is presented in the paper, and this is the one that was highlighted on the AHA conference. Um, essentially, the, age, the mean age between the patients was around 66, um, predominantly male participants. The lactate uh, at the time of enrollment was around five. Um, MAPs were in the 60, 63%. Uh, 75% um, of them or so had mechanical ventilation, and norepinephrine was the most used uh, presser here. Um, there was also uh, dobutamine renal vasopressin. And uh, I, I also want to bring attention to the causes of the cardiac neck shock. Uh, the majority of them were due to ACS, uh, and, the, and most of them were due to STEMIs. So the primary endpoint was a 30-day outcome uh, and it was all composite between death from any cause, resuscitated circulatory arrest, or implementation of another mechanical circulatory support. And as we can see on this 30-day Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, there was no significant differences at the, uh, difference between the two groups at the end of the 30-day trial. When we looked in, in uh, uh, separate categories, the death from any cause, resuscitation of cardiac arrest, or implementation of other mechanical support, there was really no difference between the groups either uh, when this happened. And I do want to highlight that there was a 39% uh, 39 uh, 39 of the patients in the conservative group uh, also ended up uh, transitioning onto ECMO uh, later on the trial. In terms of secondary uh, endpoints, uh, it was mostly looking at safety, safety endpoints, including bleeding, leg ischemia, stroke, pneumonia, and sepsis. And again, there was no significant difference between the ECMO group and the conservative management group. So the authors concluded that among patients with rapidly progressive or severe cardiac shock, immediate implementation of VA ECMO did not improve 30-day 30 uh, 30 clinical outcomes. 
immediate VA ECMO therapy was not associated with an increased incidence of adverse events, and a substantial portion of patients in early conservative therapy group require VA ECMO uh, later during their hospital stay. Our reflections here is that although there was no difference in, in primary outcomes uh, between the groups, uh, there were also no safety differences using early VA ECMO, which makes us uh, uh, think about the prior knowledge of the higher risk suspected of implementation of ECMO. At least this trial is bringing to us that ECMO uh, has similar complications or there's no uh, worsening uh, differences in potential complications uh, when implemented. The inclusion defined by the severity of the cardiac shock, um, it was not large enough to kind of look into the subgroup analysis. And we were not able to like really dive, dive deeply into whether patients with STEMI and STEMIs or other causes of shock would benefit from ECMO due to the sample size. We would like to learn more about what the outcomes look like for the subjects that crossed over from uh, the conservative group into the ECMO and really look into whether there's any differences between early ECMO versus delay ECMO, um, especially in patients that we already have this crossover data that could be their own control group uh, potentially. Uh, and these findings in thinking about our patient population here at UCSF, these findings uh, are uh, potentially not very applicable to our, our diverse patient population based on age, uh, distribution, race, ethnicity, which was mostly homogeneous population compared to the population that we he see here in San Francisco. Um, socioeconomic status was not addressed, uh, among other uh, demographic uh, um, important um, social, social determinants of health uh, um, um, factors for our patients. And with that, just uh, I would like to say thank you for my co-fellows for all the support throughout this year. It's been a, a, a really great uh, road and I'm looking forward for the future with you guys. And um, any comments from faculty? Looks like Dr. Klein had left a comment that perhaps um, class D and E of shock is a little too late and, and we could consider ECMO at an earlier time point, or perhaps based on how much uh, myocardial viability there might be. Um, any comments from the audience, especially the critical care faculty we have on the line? I have a lot to say about this trial. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Brian. Yeah, the I, the the way first, uh, just looking at our data, one of the things that make this it makes it really hard to understand what this study or what's going on in their practice environment is we have almost no STEMI contributing to our ECMO, and that's true in a lot of places in the United States, uh, depending on where you're coming from. Like the the more dense your population is, or at least your EMS response time for um for STEMI. Like dictates a lot about or has some correlation with shock. Uh, and so I think look first off just looking at the fact that they use so many STEMI patients or ECMO or and so many STEMI patients, I think raises a lot of questions about late presentation for MI. Uh, also, when patients come in with STEMI, you know, they have active chest pain, respiratory stress, and all sorts of things that drive your lactate up. That a lot of that is adrenergic drive and it's not from hypoperfusion. So it's very common for a lot of our STEMI patients to roll into the lab with a lactate of five, come out with no support and have a normal lactate within three hours. We see that all the time. So in terms of using lactate as an isolated marker for shock is particularly in STEMI with patients who are awake and experiencing their chest pain, it's, it really doesn't tell you a lot about the degree of shock that they have. Um, and then the last piece of that, that, there's no venting mentioned here. And in particular, in acute ischemia, uh, I think, or one of the, there's some data coming on this, is gonna be, there's going to be some impella studies that are coming on phase three trials or being enrolled for phase three trial, showing that early unloading is a big part of improving myocardial viability. And ECMO adds loading. It'll offload your RV, but it adds afterload. And there's animal data to suggest that ECMO, while it provides blood pressure support, may drive myocardial injury. Um, it, it may lead to no differential recovery and myocardial viability, uh, which is not the same, or which is separate from if you actually unload directly either through a uh, tandem or an impella. So there's a lot of mechanistic stuff scientifically that would set this trial up to be a failure 
And we would probably avoid managing patients how this trial is enrolling people like very specific for very scientific reasons. Especially for LAD, we would probably much more commonly directly offload the LV and de-escalate off ECMO as quickly as possible in our practice. That's an interesting perspective. Dr. Olgan, are you trying to unmute yourself? I can try to. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so nice, nice job, Arturo. I had a sort of study design question. I don't know if they addressed this in the presentation, but whenever you see a negative study, especially in a relatively small study, um, you want to understand the power and what the what the effect size is that they have to, to be able to detect given that. Did, did they talk at all, present the power calculations and talk about the effect size that they would have been able to detect? Really call it a negative study? I, I do not recall uh, reading anything about the power effect. I, I can uh, look again and, and close the loop with you later, but I, I did read the, the, the draft posted on, on circulation and I, I did not find uh, that information. I, may have, I, I can look again and let you know. I think it's in the supplementary What's that? It's in the supplementary Yeah, probably, but. Number checking. Also, oh, that crossover is just kind of crazy. It's basically saying, yeah, you're going to do medical therapy until it's clear that you can't, and then we'll throw up the white flag and ask for support. I mean, it's like, it's kind of like trying to manage somebody without antibiotics until you can't get the lactate down with fluid and then you give the antibiotics. You know, like it's just, that's a really high crossover rate, in a, especially in a small study. And the analysis they did, Archer, was that uh, intention to treat? Yes, uh, that's uh, one of the uh, points here is that this trial was intention to treat. Uh, also. Okay, great. It looks like um, Nikki had just put in the comments that they had an 80% power to detect a 50% difference between the groups. Um, Dr. Goldschlager, I see yeah, you what, have a comment. What difference though? What the, what's the effect size that they were able to detect? 50%. 50% difference. Between the two groups. Pretty huge. Um, I just wanted to Which, know just, just, I, to, really... just to drill down on that a little bit, because it's an important point. They had power to detect only a huge difference, meaning that if there was a 20% difference in the two arms, they would have had a null, a null finding like they did. So um, I'm not sure I would necessarily call this a negative study um, based on that. A 50% effect size in um, a high mortality condition is a huge effect size to, to, to miss. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Dr. Goldschlager, did you have a comment that you wanted to raise? Yeah, I hope I didn't miss it, but I was a little confused in um, their thinking behind the severe, quote unquote, mitral regurge and aortic stenosis to allow a higher EF. And what was their putative reasoning? I could theorize about MR but I wasn't clear on why that was so. That's a great question, Dr. Olslager. And uh, the exclusion criteria is only in a table and there's no uh, clear description on the reasoning behind it. Thanks. Um, Dr. Kassam had a question. Um, maybe Dr. Brian, you could answer this. Um, if there are larger studies coming from the US and Europe, um, looking more at shock from heart failure rather than acute MI. For MCS? I believe so. Atta, if you can. Yeah, that's right. Uh -oh. for Not for failure. heart failure. The, yeah, the, the good quality studies are probably going to come out in the next few years. Um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. But there's a phase three trial coming out from using impellas for early offloading. And they did, uh, they did, there's two other phase, one other phase three I know of sponsored by Abiomed for impella. And then there's a few arrest try. Well, arrest CS got or arrest got stopped early for mortality. That one just finished. Um, and I'm trying to think of other if heart failure ones. I haven't seen any actively enrolling heart failure trials for either Impella or um, 
ECMO. Why do you think that is, Connor? I mean, I, I know that we reach for some of these therapies quite often, but um, it, it does help to have some some data behind them, obviously, as, as we move forward and trying to decide which patients may benefit the best from them. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I mean, it, the first and most obvious answer is it's a really heterogeneous patient population and figuring out how you would enroll for any given device, especially for the devices that are where the manufacturers want to express efficacy. You know, you want to make sure you're testing in the right substrate. So like check testing an Impella 5.5 is really tough because it's surgically implanted. So you need to have patients that have enough time to get to an OR, to get implanted, and then benefit from the offloading and the increased perfusion. Where in acute shock, they might have so much end organ damage by the time you get there, it's over. So you have to find chronic heart failure patients that also, then they also need an out. So you go from not just promoting survival and cardiogenic shock, but you'd also want to be testing their ability to get to an advanced therapy. So like where you run that trial, patients getting them have to be able to have an out. So they, the, building your metrics for your uh, trial outcomes, I think is really challenging. Um, and then the other thing is blinding in the, or, or for randomizing in the US, since these therapies are available and most people who use them agree that it would be considered an industry standard to try to offer something for uh, appropriate patients it would be really hard to justify randomizing somebody to medical therapy, which in all inotrope trials, they all show, I mean, there's a suggestion that all inotropes accelerate mortality. Obviously the trials are not built in ICUs, but it'd be hard, to, really hard to justify that. Rita and I are actually meeting in about two hours to discuss this very topic. <laughs> but it, I think it is an area ready for some data for sure. Yeah, all right. Well, with that, I think we can conclude uh, the session today. So thanks everyone for attending and especially for the first years for taking us through those highlighted trials from the AHA conference. We're gonna have a recording of this that's gonna be available on the YouTube page. Next week, there will not be grand rounds because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So I hope everyone has a chance to celebrate and we'll see you back the following Wednesday. So November 30th, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Rebecca Hahn from Columbia speak to us on interventional imaging. Take care everyone.